So Fred, this is a little bit of a biography of Fred. He started playing cello at the age of 10 through the public school system in Maryland. And what he has to say about that day was that it was a God-given event and the instrument immediately spoke to him. He was a child of the 60s and a young hippie. Music was exploding all around him and he didn't want to just play classical music. He said he wanted to play the sounds that he heard in his head. And that's what this workshop's all about today. He listened to Cream, Jimi Hendrix, Muddy Waters, Elmore James, John Cochran, Louis Armstrong, and many others. He had a Juilliard trained teacher, but his teacher wouldn't help him to improvise and play jazz, so he learned those on his own. He went to the library, board records, and taped them on his dad's reel-to-reel -reel tape player, and he went down to jazz jam sessions, and he took lessons from jazz piano players and saxophone players. He did whatever he could to bring out the sounds that he was wanting to play, which is a real inspiration for us cellists who are kind of a little bit stuck on the page. Uh, Fred is going to help us get off the page. So now at 66, 66, he's a classically trained professional jazz, rock, blues, and improvisational cellist. He's created three solo albums and teaches private cello lessons and plays for three talent agencies in the D.C. area. And he's also played on hundreds of albums as a guest artist. So maybe he'll tell us a little bit more about his story. And he says his passion is still playing cello and trying to play the music that he hears in his soul. So Fred, over to you. Oh, well, thank you, man. You sound, you made me sound a lot better. Um, <laughs> that was you that wrote that. <laughs> yeah, I know. <laughs> That's why it was so embarrassing. Um, so hello, everybody. And thank you to Mia for this great opportunity. Uh, it's really moving. It's very flattering. Um, I'm just going to... I want to touch on a few things about... Um, the simplicity of improvisation. You can make this as difficult as you want, but what I always encourage people to do is to follow the music that they like, whether it's Celtic, rock, blues, jazz, klezmer, um, to, to start with that and to follow your passion with it. So for me, um, growing up, I was hearing like, <laughs> well, first the monkeys. No, that's that I got to go back further than that. Um, my dad uh, being Jewish, like Jewish pop music back then was musicals. So I was raised on musicals and but then I started listening to Beatles and, and uh, uh, the monkeys were on TV back then in like 1960, whatever it was, six or seven. And um, mm -hmm. but I started gradually getting more and more into blues, rock and jazz. And I, I went up to my Juilliard trained cello teacher. And I told her I really wanted to learn how to play jazz. And I thought that, you know, music was music. That there were, I didn't see a lot of categories with it. So, but she said, I don't like it and I don't teach it. And then she said something that's actually kind of true. That she said, how do you expect to play in tune if you're improvising? And that to me, like, stuck, still sticks in my mind. But um, uh, there's a ways around that as well. Um, but I started listening to blues and jazz and tried to imitate the sounds that I heard on, on recordings. And I started playing, jamming with people, which is really important if you want to be an improvising cellist, if you want to play without music in front of you all the time, play with other people. Play with guitar players, play with piano players, play with play in a band. Um, that will really, really help. Uh, when I started improvising, it was in middle school, and my friend, my best friend, was a drummer, and he had like people come to his house and jam, and I would bring my cello, and my parents bought me a little pickup 
to amplify it. And I didn't know what I was doing. I would just like hear the song and the chords and I'd try to find a, a note that blended with it. And then when the chord changed, I would change the note. Not really know what I was doing. And, and but that again, that is the, the essence of improvisation or composing is to hear the sound that's in your head to, to try to, and, and to try to match uh, what you're hearing. Um, if you're playing in a bit, like I also used to play years ago, I used to tour with a singer songwriter and we did a lot of our gigs with just me and her. And so I was pretty much it. I was like the bass player, you know, to, and would also bow and then do leads, you know, instrumental breaks. But she also had a band, a full band with drums and bass and electric guitar and her playing guitar and me playing cello. And that band was actually amazing. The bass player and the drummer were Mary Chapin Carpenter's bass player and drummer. I, I don't know if you remember her. And, um, it, but when I was playing with them, I had to change all my note choices from what I was doing as a duo. I had to find the place where the cello would fit in with that. So again, I would really encourage you to play with other people. Here's something else too, is nowadays to learn how to improvise, there's all kinds of accompaniment tracks you can find online. Uh, I've made some myself, but you can um, you can find things that are really just all in like a drone. You can just improvise in a drone in one key. Um, or you can play along with chord progressions. So there's a lot you can look at online uh, to do that. So a lot of times, and I'm going to open this up to people in, in just a minute. Um, I'm trying to anticipate maybe what people will ask. And hopefully everybody can hear me okay. Um, I'm just on my iPhone and I'm a little crooked, but that kind of matches me. <laughs> um, but I'm just going to do like a short improvisation right now. I'm just going to make something up. And here's how I describe improvisation to people. Um, remember the days when you had like a landline phone and you would have like maybe a pad and pencil by the phone and you'd be talking to somebody and maybe you'd start doodling while you were talking. Like you do one line and then maybe a connecting line and, and pretty soon you'd start coming with an abstract shape or you would start seeing something and you would build on it. And that's what improvisation is. Instead of a line, you're doing a note and then you do another note and that connects with the first note. And pretty soon you start hearing things or seeing things that you wanna add. And maybe you have to uh, futz around to find what the right note is. Um, and that's part of the process too. The, the real drawback I have seen to classical training, traditional classical training, and to me it's a very serious one, is that it teaches people to be only readers, to interpret what somebody else has written. And this is great works. So, I mean, you know, Beethoven, Brahms, Bach, all the, <laughs> anybody that starts with a B, Paccarini. Um, um, but you can also just play your instrument with no notes in front of you. And that's one of the beauties of it. We don't, we do that like we journal and, you know, those that journal do that or those that draw and keep journals do that. But as musicians, we don't think we can do that. We've been trained that we, that the only way to play music is to get out, you know, your Suzuki book three and, and 
play something out of that or play, you know, the Bach cello suite, which is, they're incredible stuff, but you can just, I want to encourage you that you can just create. It doesn't even have to be good. It can just be random notes. So I'm going to do a little improv now. I'll just, uh, <laughs> That's just something that just popped in my head. Now I've been doing this a while, so I can kind of hear things of where I want to go. But, um, and one more thing I want to talk about, because I, I was kind of advertised this way is blues. Blues is a particular kind of music and it uses a scale. If you want to learn how to improvise, to accompaniment tracks or to drones, you could really do worse than learning blues scales. So a blues scale, I'm gonna do a major one first. It's based off, I'll do a C pentatonic, C major pentatonic scale. So a pentatonic scale, of course, is five notes. So if I'm in C, I have C, D, E, G. So it's the first note, second note, third note, fifth note, and sixth note of the scale. Now a blues scale adds not just the major third, but the minor third. Fred, so, could you, um, could I just ask a question, Fred? Real yes. quickly. So in that key of C, can you tell people, because I know some people are taking notes, can you tell people what the names of the notes are? Yes. On that scale you just uh, played? So it's, well, for, before I go into just the names of the notes in C, yeah. so a pentatonic scale if is using the first note, the second note, the third note of the major scale. You skip the fourth note and go right to the fifth note. So and then the sixth note. So it's C, D, E, G, A, and then back to C. Now, if you're doing a blues scale, the, what blues is, it's got this incredible combination of major and minor tonalities. That's what makes it sound so good. It's, it's, it's actually based off African scales, which use, um, that's why you like, in blues, that's one of the reasons they bend notes, like. <laughs> Um, but so with a blues scale, you not only have the E natural, you also have the E flat. So you have C, D, E flat, E natural, G, A. Now, what you do with most blues is you flip that on its head and you do the relative minor. Now, most of you know what the relative minor of C major is A minor. You go down a, a third. And I don't know, I, hopefully I'm not going over anybody's head here with, with music theory. Music theory comes really naturally to me, unlike, <laughs> as you all have seen, technology. I was just going to say, Fred, that, yeah, that music theory, I we want to slow that down a bit. <laughs> um, I'm like, I'm not even in kindergarten when it comes to technology. Um, so the minor scale, you would go, you would start on the A. So we got A, C, D, E flat, E, G, A. Like I, and with the A minor blues scale, I love to play the A string and I have my first finger on C natural, third finger on C and fourth finger on E flat. 
and it's like tailor made like blues licks where it sounds like you know what you're doing. <laughs> So blues has got a lot of signature licks and styles, rhythms, and that's true with, with any kind of music. Any kind of music has kind of its own little rhythmic and uh, harmonic schemes to it. Um, anyway, and, and then one more thing I want to talk about is jazz. So jazz is a whole nother spectrum of... It, I used to get a little upset. It's like, it's like the scale people got a hold of jazz and it used to drive me nuts. It's like, you know, I had to know what an F sharp half diminished seventh was, you know, and, and, and I had to learn what an augmented scale was. And, and, um, but over time it started slowly filtering in and making sense. So to play jazz is, um, I would say do it if you really have a passion for it, but it's, it's a quite a learning curve. You have to really learn your music theory and scale theory and chord theory and how it all fits together. And, and with a lot of jazz tunes, they don't, it doesn't just stay in one key the whole time. It, it, like a classical piece, it, it converts keys. Like in a classical piece, if you see, excuse me, if you see an accidental, it's because the composer has changed keys. I don't know if you all know that, but that's what he's done. He or she has done is, is like he's shifted the tonality. That's what the accidental is. But um, so that's, that's my spiel. And I wanted to open it up and hopefully I'll be able to hear you. I don't be able, I can't really hear really well because I'm on my my little yeah. iPhone. That's no worries. About... What we're yeah, what we're gonna do, Fred, is that people can ask their questions. So on both sides of Fred, you'll see there's a place where you can ask questions by typing. And then if you want to talk to him like directly, and we can see you, there's a microphone. So you can go to either of those spots. And I'm just gonna take one question at a time. I'll tell it to Fred, and then Fred, you can we can open it up, and you can talk to the person whose question it is. Does that sound good? I either see someone on the lower right yes. raising their hand or that's yes. a thumbnail. So Fred, can you hear me? I can hear you a okay. little bit. You're like a, a little, little bit. tiny okay. person. Okay, I'm going to go closer to my microphone. So so Fred, so Susan, if Susan, you want to unmute your microphone, do you want to ask Fred your question, Susan? Well, my question is, what is there a typical chord progression for a song that starts in A minor, um, like using the a, that A minor? Um, would there be a typical pro uh, chord progression and would it typically transition to a certain key like it like happens in, you know, not, not blues music? I, well, yes and no. There are, there are typical chord progressions. Um, like with a, an A minor blues, there's like a typical chord progression. Um, but you want to, each song has got its own chord progression that you would fit what you're doing with, with it. Now, I actually have, and I was telling Mia, you know, for everybody here, I'm going to send them uh, a free either teaching thing for improv or blues or like one of my arrangements whatever you guys want you would just like i'd probably just have you do it through mia but you there's no one typical progression no like um it's not like a one four five five seven kind of thing right like a blues an a minor blues would be uh like an a Oh, wait a minute. Give me a second. Oh, good question, Sue. One got him, second. Got him thinking. <laughs> so this is my composing tool. So like a, an A blues, A minor blues would be A 
minor, D minor, back to A minor, D minor, back to A minor. And this is where it gets really kind of cool at the end. You go to a F7, to E7, back to A minor, back to E7. So that's one, that's a typical minor blues progression, but you know, like, let's say you're doing Bob Dylan's All Along the Watchtower that Hendrix made famous. You're just going from A minor to G to F back in, or, or maybe you're doing, um, um, uh, House of the Rising Sun, you know? Yeah. So every song has its own chord progression that you would fit your cello part to. And that's where you want to know about scales and chord theory. Uh, and it, it all depends. Like, are you accompanying a singer? Are you the low instrument in the group? Are you acting as a bass player? Are you um, doing a lead, like a lead guitar player, but on cello? So it really, you are like trying to create craft apart according to the the song itself. Hopefully that <laughs> made that was, some no, that sense great. to somebody. That gave us a, a good example of some um, progressions we can work through. I actually had a question because you brought up the idea of like voicing, right? When you're a cello player, how you can play the lower voice or a middle voice or an upper voice. Right. When you're playing, do you intuitively kind of decide which voice you're going to take? Uh, depending on who you're playing with? I base it on who I'm playing with. So, um, I, I had a, um, uh, so I'm going to cry with this. I had a, a performing duo with like a musical soulmate and I, Peter Fields, that was like, uh, he was like me. He was classically trained, but played jazz and blues and rock and he composed. And he played a nylon, uh, classical guitar, nylon string guitar. You can see a lot of this stuff on YouTube. And we both composed, but I found with him and it was so cool. It didn't sound as good when I went way up on the cello. It sounded better. It blended with his instrument better if I kept in the mid to low range, which was great for me because I didn't have to like fly all up and down. But if I'm playing with a rock band and I'm talking about with bass and everybody there is kind of in the mid range. And if I'm going to cut through, I got to get way up on my cello. So it, it, it really, yes, you use your ear and, and you figure out where you're going to blend. But the, the best way to learn how to improvise, I think, is to go online and start searching out some of these play along tracks. And, and uh, like I said, a lot of them are just drones. You know, just droning on a G and you can just play G major to your heart's content. And just get used to it. Am I am I babbling too much? No, not at all. It's really interesting stuff. Yeah, for sure. Very interesting. I was thinking maybe what we could do, because uh, we have a nice group here, but it's not too big. We could go around the room and maybe ask each person where they're at with improvisation. And if there's a specific question <clears throat> that they would want to have answered about that process, because I know we're all in different places, right? Because some of us in oh, my yeah. classes, we improvise. Some people are more comfortable with it. Uh, maybe we can just see where everyone's at what, with their improvisation. Let me interrupt one second. Yeah, for sure. What I really want to do is take away people's fears of improv. 
it's you can take this to whatever level you want to. Uh, you can become the next Charlie Parker. Uh, hopefully everybody knows who that is, or John Coltrane. But you don't have to. It's, it's really as simple as taking your instrument out. And, and I encourage all my students to do this, and I'm encouraging all of you to do this. Take your cello out and play with no music in front of you and start making things up. It's not as hard as you think it is. So I, I want to take away the mystery of it. It's, it's as simple as drawing a picture on a piece of paper. You don't even have to think in terms of key signatures or time signatures. Just start playing. So anyway. Yeah, let's op let's open this up. So maybe let's go around and see. Why don't we start down here with Pamela? Pamela, if you want to just uh, unmute your microphone. Hi, Hello. everybody. Hey, hey Pam. Pam. Hi. <laughs> so tell us, Pam, about your experiences with improvising. So um, I've been working a lot lately with the um, the longbow meditation, and. Um, I have the drone on and a lot of times I'll improvise, just, you know, do some notes and make it sound cool. Like I like it, <laughs> <laughs> but here's my question. Sometimes I worry about playing the wrong note. As we do, as all of us do. <laughs> um, so you're playing with a drone? Mm -hmm. There are no wrong notes. But there's got to be, like, if I'm playing a C drone, then I shouldn't be playing any sharps, right? Mm -mm. You shouldn't be playing what? Any sharps. E sharp? Any, any, sharp? any, any sharps? Any sharps, she said. Sure you can. Oh, okay. <laughs> so here's the thing. If you're just doing one drone, um... You're just creating intervals off that drone. Um, and if you hit a note, like let's say, all right, so I'm playing a G, open G. Now, if I play a D with it, it sounds good. Here's an E flat. that like there's a lot of clash there but it doesn't make it a bad note what what um i do if i hit a note that's feels like it's clashing it's not a bad thing what you do is you resolve it and i'll tell you a really cool a really cool secret is most of the time the note that will resolve a note that feels like it's clashing is to go to the note right below it or right above it. And here's why, because all chords or most of the chords that we deal with are built on stacked thirds, one, three, five, seven, nine. So let's say you're playing, you're playing a, a C natural and there's a G major chord going on. So that chord is G, B, and D, and you're playing a C natural. So if you just go down to a B or up to a D, boom, you've resolved it. You've resolved the conflict. So Fred, I taught um, everybody who came to my group, but kind of a joke in the last session. And the joke was <laughs> you're only ever half a step away from playing the right note. That's right. <laughs> That's right. Well, thank you. <laughs> yeah, and, and a lot of a lot of improvisers say there's no such thing as a as a bad note. I, I've done recording sessions where you know I'm just I get called in because it's with a band or a singer songwriter, and uh, I'm making up parts for them. 
nothing's right now. And there are some times where I've made mistakes. I thought there were mistakes, but those are the ones that actually got on the CD because they sat, they really added something to it. So yeah, there's no such thing when you're improvising. That's the beauty of improvising. You're not making a mistake. <laughs> Just not written out. So that's that's great. Pam, does that answer your question? Yeah. All right. Let's go to Christy. Christy, you want to tell everybody about your improvising and what's going on for you? Sure. Um, so I have been doing some improvisation for the last, I'll say like 18 months or so. Um, not great at it, but you know, like you said, no wrong note necessarily. So I try to do like the chromatic improv and stuff like that sometimes too. Um, where I tend to struggle is like, if I just pick up my cello and try to improvise without any kind of backing track, I, the rhythm to me sometimes like doesn't feel right. So that, yeah. 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 Well, here's the, th what was your name again? Christy. Christy, here's the thing. And I know Neil will back me up on this. We're cello players, damn it. It's like, we don't care if we play the right note or the right rhythm, as long as our tone is good and we have good vibrato. Yes. <laughs> All right. Everything I told them everything is tone. Yes. <laughs> I like it. <laughs> Yeah, if you got if you got good tone, that's oh, and that's. I know you guys are students in Mia's, and what she's doing, I think, is incredibly important because I want to bring this up. It the most important thing is not what you're playing; it's how you play it, and at you always always want to be relaxed you know in your fingers in your bow grip it's like the mistake people make is they feel like the strength they got to make their fingers talk and that is like it's gonna mess up everything it's gonna mess up your tone it's gonna it could mess up your your hand you know 10 to 9 is that kind of thing but the thing is to always be fluid to have your fingers relax. The strength doesn't come through tensing your fingers. The strength, it's like it flows. It, it comes from the, the core of your back up through your shoulders and arms and through your fingers. So when you tense your fingers or you tense any part of your body, it's like a hose with a kink in it. And I'm sure this is, I'm. Mia talks about this stuff. It's it's vitally important. To Would you learn. say, Fred, when you talk about that, when you talk about the tightening and um, it relates to rhythm, right? So when Christy was saying sometimes she loses a sense of rhythm, um, right. I'm thinking that's you know sometimes you lose that because something in your body or, or your mind becomes tense. Yeah, and rhythm can be affected by overthinking as well. Do you find it, that? It, it's it's very hard sometimes to understand the rhythm that's on the page like i write out all my arrangements now and i write out like my improvisations you know note for note and then i look at the page it's like it's like i can't play this <laughs> you know it's it's it, the rhythms look so hard but it's like when I improvise it, it just kind of flows. So yes, rhythms can be very, very challenging. And it's uh, the, the written out music language is, is a lot to understand. You know, so yeah, it can be what do challenging. You do, what do you do, Fred, to improve your sense of rhythm? Wow. Or what have you done? Um, I have to slow it down kind of what you were saying, slow it down, not only tempo wise on a metronome, but in my mind, I got to slow it down. When I write out my arrangements or uh, write out an original piece, the notes, usually I know what they are. It's the rhythms are the things that sometimes I really have to work through to figure out what that rhythm is. 
-hmm. how to write it out. If you see some of my arrangements, you'll know what I mean. I mean, there's a lot of, there's a lot of that kind of stuff. And I can play it, but I can't, it's hard to write. So writing, like learning how to interpret the written page is, is challenging. Mm -hmm. it takes work. So I wish I could give you a better answer with that. No, I haven't I mean, really, I know I'm talking too much and I'm sorry. No, no, not at all. That's what you're here for. It's your workshop. Um, there's a great story about this. Um, every, please tell me you guys know who John Coltrane is. Mm -hmm. Yes, everybody. Famous, famous jazz tenor sax player. Played with everybody. Played with Miles Davis and had an incredible solo career. Um, so there was uh, a saxophone player named Andrew White, who actually lived near me in Washington, D.C. And he had it his life mission to write out every note that John Coltrane ever recorded, whether it was the melody or an improvisation, just thousands and thousands of pages of John Coltrane music. And Andrew White presented it to John Coltrane one time. He showed him like the notes that he had played in his recorded career. And John Coltrane said, I can't play that shit. <laughs> anyway, that's my that's my right that's that's my rhythm story. It's hard. <laughs> that's so funny. That's great. Why don't we go to the next person? <laughs> Irene, do you want to tell us where you're at on your improvisation journey? I have not, <clears throat> excuse me, I've not done a lick of it. Except I, for when I make you, right? When you make me and I get so stressed out and tense. Um, now, something that Fred said is a little is a little discouraging in that, as you know me, I came to music very late in life. And I have a lot of catching up to do with my theory. Mm -hmm. um, but I am encouraged about hearing about like the online um, tracks, the accompanying tracks. That you can play and along I, to. And I guess just starting simple and not having great expectations. I, yeah. have, I, I, have, I don't know where to start with questions. It's sort no, no, of, that's, that's fine. That's fine. Yeah. You, here's a couple things. One, you, you don't have to improvise. And I applaud you that you started that you're starting cello so late in life. To me, age doesn't mean anything. To me, like the desire to play is everything. If you want to play and you're playing, God bless you, you're doing the right thing. Um, but like I said, you don't have, when you improvise, you can just, like, let's say you're on your D string and you're just going from D to E. You're improvising. If you don't have, like, uh, music in front of you doing it, you're improvising, you're making something up. Or if you're just going from D to A. And maybe you start adding a note or two. You're improvising. It doesn't have to be hard. Yeah, I mean, Thank to you, add Fred. to, yeah, to add to that, yeah. like when I'm talking, you know, Pam said she does her longbow meditations and then it kind of sometimes moves into something. And that's what, what you're I trying found. to do is to play your inner voice um, without sounding too cosmic. Um, you're trying to play the music that you feel and hear. But I will encourage you that more you do it, the better you will get at it. 
when I started improvising, when I started trying to learn how to play jazz, it, 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 it sounded awful. It, it just did. It, 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 there's no other way around it. But it's like I enjoyed doing it, and it didn't bother me that it sounded, <laughs> it sounded so bad because I, I was wanting to do it. So, but don't feel bad about it and don't be overwhelmed with theory. Okay. It, it, just don't. It's, you can improvise. Here's another thing I'll tell you. Like, one of my favorite jazz musicians ever, ever is Charlie Parker, alto saxophone player. And his improvisations were just mosaics. They were perfectly crafted. And, and he didn't read a lick of music. He didn't know what he was doing. He didn't know any theory. But we all, you know, we all have our own gifts, you know. And if you're starting later in life and you're loving playing, my God, you're doing great. <laughs> you know, you're doing awesome. Claps for Irene. Thanks for you. <laughs> let's go to let's go to Kathy. Kathy, you want to tell us about what's going on in your? Uh, you have a very interesting uh, thing that you're working on. You want to tell us right about your project? Okay. Um, in terms of improv, I'm like Irene. I'm very, very new to it, and I'm rather intimidated. And I really do prefer having something written in front of me. It gives me, it's kind of like a crutch to feel like I'm playing the right thing in that. And so I'm, I'm trying to take some music that I want to play that's in piano score and transpose it and, and create a cello score that I can then play from because I can't improvise very well. So it sounds like you're arranging cello parts from piano parts. Is that what you're saying? Yeah, I guess so. That's pretty cool. <laughs> Yeah, you, again, you don't have to improvise. If you feel, everybody in this room, if you feel more comfortable reading music, read music. Again, to me, the, the, it's, I said this before, it's not what you play, it's how you play it. It's like what your folk, you know, to have that relaxed focus. That that's to me the key. So I was just thinking, Fred, about how you know, in the jazz tradition, you have those people that never read a lick of music, and then you have those people who write out every solo, right? And you sort of have all those people in between, like the, it's sort of people find the thing that works for their brain. That's right. right. Would you agree? Yes. Yeah. yeah. So you find uh, what works for you. Right. I'm a little unusual in that I'm classically trained, but I, from a young age, I started improvising and playing other kinds of music. And there was a time in my life where I was really thinking that I needed to just do classical. And I tried that for a while, like when I was in college. And right when I got out of college, I realized that wasn't me. You know, I, I couldn't compete like in a, trying to get an or, orchestral position with a cello player that all they did all their life was eat, drink, sleep, play classical music. That wasn't me. Classical music was like a part of what I played. So, um, oh shoot, now I can't remember what the train of thought was, but um, th there is room 
for everybody in this thing called music. It's the, the key is to find what works for you. You know? Yeah, very cool. So y'all got mixed up here, but I think I remember who's talked and who hasn't. So let's start. Let's go to Andrew. You want to tell Fred what you're up to? Oh, I think you were already unmuted. Hello, can you hear me? We can. Yes. Okay, cool. Uh, yeah, I mean, I, so currently I am, yeah, just working on loosening up, letting myself play, you know, play clashing notes, sloppy notes, letting it kind of all hang out. Um, <laughs> that's not really my history. My history is paper trained, classically trained. Um, but I did, uh, I did play trombone back in the day. And so I, I was exposed to improvisation through being in jazz band and, and, and learned some music theory, but I've since forgotten quite a bit of it. Um, <laughs> so it is at least coming back to me as I dive more into improvising again. But I'm, I, I think what would be fun for me is doing more. Yeah. I, I, I play, I played with my father-in-law who's a guitarist and, I was just like, I mean, if you just play like G and D for a bit, I can probably plunk around and find some stuff. And we did that and it was pretty fun. I don't, I didn't play anything that blew either of our minds, but that was okay. It was a good time. And yeah, um, I have a friend who plays ukulele and so he and I will sometimes play and um, yeah, I've, I've, I think I've had the most success keeping it simple playing longer tones. I mean, I'd love to get into more of what you've just been kind of sharing tonight, those those fun licks. Um, but uh, I mean, I'm sure, like you said, revisiting those scales will help, those blue scales. Um, yeah. Because it sounds like that's a lot of what you're incorporating into some of what you were Yeah, the nice thing about blues, the nice thing about blue scales and pentatonic scales is there is no wrong notes. Nice, yeah. There's no avoid notes. Mm -hmm. Like if you're playing a major scale, um, there are notes that you, that are gonna clash with a chord. Right. But if you're right. playing a blues scale, that's primarily what lead guitar players do throughout rock history is they play blues scales. Yeah, yeah. Um, do you, I don't know if I can also sneak in a question during this time. I, well, you know, of course. Uh, I was reminded uh, while you were talking about, you know, playing with good tone, like some of like somebody I remember early on being impressed with how they could make ugly sound and it was still cool was like Jimi Hendrix. And so I didn't know if you had any suggestions for stylistically manipulating your tone for like rock versus <laughs> you know like or, or do you or do you keep it pretty and vibrato like i i mean i guess that's certainly no a no i try to imitate the sound and it's sure. funny you you talked about jimmy because jimmy hendrix it, so if i had a mount rushmore of four players it would be jimmy hendrix Joni Mitchell, who's Canadian. All right. Yeah. Bach and John Coltrane. Yeah. Nice. A good one. Yeah. Um, but yeah, Jimmy. So yeah, you're you're trying to imitate, imitate the sound of um, one of the cool things the cello because we don't have frets like guitar players they have to bend the string to raise the note pitch and we can like just slide up that slide up that string to do it. Those sticky slides we've been learning about, guys. All oh, they're good yeah. for those. <laughs> and Celtic music uses slides too. Mm -hmm. 
it's it's a little different than blues but yeah so i that's a really good question so i try to imitate if I, i'm trying to play hendrix i'm trying to imitate his sound one of the hardest things to do is i think to imitate vocalists mm, yeah um to try to imitate that kind of sound you know especially if you're doing pop rock stuff as opposed to you know opera because you know it's very stylized yeah so. we found that in our last session of our chill cats because we were doing some pop in those rhythms you know when they're oh, yeah. written, when they're written out the vocal rhythms are written out but it doesn't sound anything like what the singer would sing it so then you kind of have mm -hmm. to make like a creative decision <laughs> for what you're gonna actually do so whenever i do pop tunes i change what's written on the page almost always thank you so much i appreciate it yeah, yeah it sounds question, like you're doing Jay. some good stuff that's that's neat. thanks Keep it up. Thank oh you. and i wanted to say one thing really popped in my mind for everybody here if you have a buddy that plays guitar and preferably like acoustic guitar like whether it's a folk guitar or a nylon string classical guitar play with them i'm telling you man cello and guitar is magic um it, it's just the the blending of those two to, uh instruments is amazing and it's it's so much easier than playing i don't know how many of you have played like cello piano sonatas with a piano player but it's very easy for piano player to drown out a cello player but with guitar and cello you don't have to work at it it just like blends so perfectly you know so that brings us like a buddy that is that you that sings and plays guitar or or that plays guitar and you can just do cello and guitar do it because it's it's worth it i was just gonna say Frank, the next person i was gonna ask to talk is sebastian and he plays with his dad who plays uh, acoustic guitar and it cool. just sounds so cool so he can tell us about what it, what you've been doing, if you've been doing anything with your dad lately, Seb. Yeah, so, so far, um, I'm kind of new to the whole guitar, cello mix, and uh, my dad's been playing guitar for a lot longer than I've been playing cello, and it's kind of like I'm starting to learn how to mix the two together, but uh, I'm, I'm fairly confident when it comes to improvising but i'm also kind of not confident in the sense that i i've been basically the my entire um a cello career so far has been basically just learning classical and now putting in a variant that's improv is it feels off a bit do you know how to read? Do you work from chord charts? Uh, no, I don't think. I think you've done a little bit of that with me, right? Like when you're yeah, dad, you a, a little bit. But we've been focusing a lot on note reading for sure. Yes. Yeah. Because yeah, uh, well, like for example, yeah, to go from like a classical reading, to, you know, that's something we've been talking about, right? That classical reading to like getting off the page. What's your number one advice for that, Fred? Huh. I, just starting, just doing it, and and putting up with the fact that it's you're not always going to hit it a hundred percent of the time. I mean, I like I said, I'm lucky in that I started this quite young, um, in middle school, like jamming with friends, and. Um, I didn't know what I was doing. And it was the same kind of thing. I would just do like one note per guitar chord. And then when the chord changed, and I didn't know what chords they were, I would just use my ear to try to figure out where it would blend. And and that's 
there's nothing wrong with that. Okay. I mean, now I have a lot of chord and scale theory behind it. Plus, I also, if I'm playing with a guitar player because I play guitar, even if I don't know the song, I can look at their hands and I know what chords they're playing. So that kind of helps me too. But I would say just start out simple like you're doing. There's nothing wrong with it. It's a good All thing. Right. And it's a great thing that, your dad, that you're playing with your dad. I mean, my God. Yeah, they make a dynamic duo. They played a tango at the, one of our concerts. Really? It's super cool. <laughs> yeah. Very cool. No, that's, man, that's a wonderful thing that you're playing music with your dad. Thank you. So that's your takeaway from that. <laughs> Let's go to um, Helena. Helena is uh, new to our group. Thanks for joining us. It's nice to meet you. I know we've chatted online here and there. Yeah, I nice to <laughs> And I actually went to see Fred at a restaurant where he was playing in Alexandria a few months ago. I'm not sure if you remember that. It was a memoir of your friend. Who Who is this? Can you guys hear me? Yeah, I, I can, can hear you now. I think oh, he, yeah. he, he, the, he didn't hear what you said about the name. Oh, yeah. I said I actually met Fred once at a restaurant in Alexandria. He was playing at a memoir for one of his friends or... Your friend that oh for Peter yeah that the um, so you were at that memorial concert yeah oh wow in Alexandria it was a yes, while yes at Laporta's yeah Laporta that's it that's it um my question is um thanks nice being here my question is improvise is improvising another way of finding notes that's in your mind you know like if you know a song then you Okay, it's 50% of it to me is like knowing what it sounds like in your head and then trying to find out how, you know, finding the way on the fingerboard. So, or is that called playing by ear? I'm, I guess I'm getting confused with sight reading and improvising. Is that, are they related? Um, y yes, <laughs> that's a lot. Um, Again, a, a lot of it initially is just feeling things out. You, you never get away from using your ear, ever, ever, ever. I don't care how much theory you know. Now, some people are really, really gifted with perfect pitch. And they don't, they, they hear this stuff right away. My younger son is like this. My younger son, eh, I don't even want to get into it, but um, I'm not quite like that. I, but I'm always listening to hear where I need to blend in. And a lot of that, like with Peter and I, I, I guess you didn't see us perform. But um, we would get together and practice a lot to work out things. So there were, we worked, oh God, I, I'm getting far afield, but we were working. Oh no. <laughs> I guess we lost Fred for a second there. I think he has to plug in his phone. There's some great questions uh, that we're going to ask him when he when he gets back that you guys are posting on the on the side here. So we'll get him to do a, a demo for sure. Yeah, feel free if you have a question um, that you don't want to ask directly, you can put it in the question box and then I can I'll just ask it to him. We can see you, Fred, but we don't have your sound. Oh, I think actually, do you want to talk for a second? I think you might be back. No, yeah, we can't hear you.
Oh, yeah, we're back. Okay, that right. was so weird. That was an Amber Alert came in. Oh, weird. Did, did it throw off your phone? And it, like, it had one of those kind of emergency, like, eh, type things that came in. <laughs> That's all right. The show will so go let on. Let me put my phone back. These are great questions, guys. We're really getting deep into uh, improvising and how to do it. All right. Um, so, uh, yeah, there's a few questions actually in the box here, Fred, that maybe we can go through. Someone here asked if you can demonstrate a fun Boeing Pizzicato slap lick. Oh, a, a couple. Now? A Boeing Pizzicato slap lick. I guess people want to see you do some slapping on your cello. You know when you slap the string? Oh, you give mean your, like give your chopping? Best yeah, probably chopping. You know, chopping, I am chopping. not... I'm Maybe not slapping. much of a chopping expert. Uh, I've definitely seen it. You're better I'm than not, me. I'm not much of a chopper. <laughs> Yeah. So what I about what really... about when you what about when you do your pizzicato? Do you slap the 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 fingerboard ever? Do you use that technique? Not really. There you go. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I just play it. It depends on what I'm doing. I can play it like a a bass. Yeah. Like that, just a simple boogie thing, but you can also play it like a guitar. That kind of stuff. Yeah. It depends on what, again, it depends on what the tune is. Right. Um, but yeah, I, I, I don't do a lot of that. Um, I can't remember the name of it, but... What is it called with the bow with the the slap bow technique? I've definitely seen people do it, and but I've I've never really developed it very much. So you kind of keep it simple, yeah. In that way, and then one other question was somebody, and you sort of you touched on this before a little bit. How do you slide or bend notes? Oh well, <laughs> well most of the time. What you do is you start flat. Like, let's say, like I've done this before here today, but let's say I'm playing a blues and I want to go up to this E. So I just did the notes A, C, D, C, E. But let's say I'm playing blues. And I want to slide up to the E, so I hit, I hit E flat. One second, Sue, so could we just get you to meet microphone and slowly yeah. slide up to it? Could you repeat that? Because I think we lost the sound. And and another kind of blues lick that that is done a lot is something like. So I'm going from an E flat to an E to to a G. Like that. Very cool. And then there's one more here. Um, what was that one there? What kind of bowing techniques might you use for jazz or blues that might be different than you would use? Okay. Other things. So, um, one thing with jazz phrasing with swung notes is, um, let me see, how do I, um, what's, what you do, God, I, I hope I don't lose everybody here because I'm, I'm, I'm not sure I'm going to explain this correctly, but let's say, let me, in jazz, everybody has heard of swung eighth notes before. Yeah, we've been working on some jazz. Okay, we're pretty so familiar. they're written out as normal eighth notes, 
but what you're really doing is swinging it is your it's not quite a triplet but you're making it into a triplet where the first eighth note gets two notes of the triplet and the second one gets one note so it'd be like and like you could have something written that looks like this straight eighth notes one and two and three and four like that but the way you would play it is like that and that's swinging them now what i do and this is and this is where i'm hoping i can not gonna lose people it's if I'm swinging it, I'm going, I'm going to slur from the second eighth note of the beat into the first eighth note of the next beat, like this. So it's one and two, like that. As opposed to, I, I don't know if I could even do it the other way. So if I do it the other way, I'm 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 slurring one and and two and and it makes it sound a lot more square as opposed to like that. So that is that's actually something I went to a a jazz sax player for lessons. I brought my cello and he was playing tenor sax and he's the one who suggested that to me to slur it that way even though he didn't know a, a, a thing about bowed instruments he just heard it right away he said why don't you slur it that way does that make sense to people like it, with jazz so that's with swung yeah. eighth notes you're slurring from the second eighth note of the beat into the next eight, the eighth note of the next beat yeah, so some of us in our ensemble have been playing a tune called Sweet Rose. It's from this book, which is the Jazz Cello Wizard. I don't know if you know this book, Fred, but it has that type of thing in the melody. It has yeah. the uh, the the swung into the next beat uh, thing. So yeah, that's it's good to know. It's good for everyone to know that that's kind of idiomatic to jazz. Yeah. It's all over jazz. And every. Yeah. Here's the thing, it's like every style of music has its own uh, its own idiom to it, its only way of playing it. Like there was a while, a number of years ago, I was playing with a lot of Celtic musicians. And I was thinking, well, how hard, you know, I'm a jazz player, how hard can this be? And then it's like, I, I went to a, a a teacher who actually has won the U.S. Scottish Fiddle Championships three years in a row. And she actually just lives near me. And I went to her and it's like all of a sudden I realized I didn't know what the heck I was doing. So like Irish and Scottish music has its own language. And that's what I'm saying is like if you're playing blues, if you're into blues, you got to get into the language. If you're into Celtic music, you got to get into the language of it. It's kind of like learning a foreign language in a lot of ways. But again, to just improvise is is different. To just improvise is to get on your instrument and just start playing, making stuff up. You don't have to play jazz or blues or Celtic or klezmer or. Indian music or, you know, whatever. I don't know. I'll shut yeah. up. No, that's cool. <laughs> yeah, we got a couple of people here who haven't had a chance to talk yet. So let's go to Karen. Karen's new to our group, and I'm sure she would love to, to chat with you. You want to tell us about your journey, Karen, with improvisation? Are you there? I think you might be muted. So just look for, Karen, you'll want to look for your unmute button. Look for the microphone. That's all right, Karen. I don't know what I'm doing either. <laughs> yeah. Our, we have a lesson every week. It's called Mute and Unmute. It's a weekly <laughs> lesson. <laughs> 
Sorry. Oh. Oh, <laughs> now we lost your video too. Well, maybe we'll come back to Karen. Um, why don't we go to Allison? Allison's my mom. So we were talking about Scottish music. She might be able to tell you something about fiddle. <laughs> yeah, not a lot. My, my question's about if you've got 16 bars to improvise, how many different rhythms would you use without it sounding chaotic? <laughs> Because mine always sounds chaotic. I can get the notes, but I try all different things, and it doesn't it doesn't have any shape of any kind. What kind of music are you playing? Well, just improvising on like Sweet Rose or something. Yeah, we've been playing a little bit of jazz. Um, I don't know. Are you a chaotic person? <laughs> No, not really. I'm a classically trained. I'm trying to be more chaotic. <laughs> <laughs> She's chaotic in training. So she could be more like me, right, Mom? Yeah, right. That, yeah. <laughs> Maybe, you know, just drop a tab of acid before you stop start playing. Um, uh, smoke a little weed. I don't know. I'm, I'm kidding. I don't do any of that stuff. I just look the part. I don't do any of that. Um, I, I don't know what to tell you. I mean, I would have to hear it. Um, I would say maybe try to keep it simple. There's nothing wrong. Okay. Here's a misconception with jazz, and I had it for years. I... And it's, I've already told you, like, one of my heroes is Charlie Parker. And Charlie Parker was an alto saxophone player that pretty much invented this style of music called bebop. And bebop was really lots of notes, lots of chord changes, very complicated. It's, it's like if Brahms or Stravinsky got a hold of jazz. And I was trying to play like that for years. Lots of notes, lots of rhythms. And you know what really changed my life is I started listening to Miles Davis. Now, if you listen to Miles Davis, Miles Davis doesn't play a lot of notes. And not only that, he uses space. He uses silences. Very powerful. He doesn't, he doesn't feel like he has to play all the time. So you don't have to be chaotic. It's, it's, you're not being creative if you use a lot of notes necessarily. So strip it down, maybe. You know, I, 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 again, I haven't heard you play, but I know that's a misconception that we all have is like the more, <laughs> it's like talking, which I'm doing a lot now. The, the more <laughs> words we use, the more intelligent we sound, and it's actually usually the same. <laughs> hey Karen, nice. did you get your your uh, microphone unmuted? I think she did. There she is, and she even found the microphone too. Oh, unfortunately, we still can't hear you. Sadly, you know no. what? Yeah, it's very very quiet. Could you maybe write your question in the question box, and then I'll ask it for you? Because it's very quiet. It's hard for us to hear you. That might be a, a thing to do. Well, while she's doing while she's doing that, I actually wanted to sort of talk to what my mom was saying about all those notes. And I found when I first improvised, the same thing was going on for me. Like I was just playing a lot of notes. And I think when you come from a classical background, that's almost the intuition because because in classical music, there's so many notes often, mm -hmm. right? That you feel like you gotta fill all the space with all the notes. And similar to you, Fred, I started listening to some sort of minimalist music. Um, for me, it was like electronic dance music, actually, <laughs> just minimalist. And then I started putting notes in there, and that felt better. Yeah, took away some of the chaos. Yeah. So let me ask you all something. Is So is Mia like the best teacher in the world? <laughs> Yes, I'm seeing Aww. some cute... Yes, yeah, You're clapping, all very sweet. Yeah. What you're doing, I mean, we, we've only talked over the phone, but <laughs> I, I really want to emphasize this. 
I've been playing cello a long time, and the key to playing cello or to anything is to learn how to relax when you play. And it has to be done according to knowledge. I mean, you can relax all you want to, but if you have a lousy bow grip, it's, you know, or if your thumb's in the wrong place on the fingerboard. So you have to do it according to knowledge. But you want to always relax and focus when you play. That's the key to the universe. Whether you're improvising or you're playing, you know, Baccarini Minuet out of, you know, Suzuki 3. Um, can I ask you this? Beyond, you know, uh, taking a hit of acid, what can we do to relax before we play? Um, I, I, I think... I think it's practice, uh, but I think it's also consciously thinking about it. I know you probably have some techniques that you use. I've never really done that. Um, I just, over time, I've been blessed with learning how to relax more and more when I play. Um, I didn't used to be like that. I was like most, oh my God, and to anyone who's ever taught boys, like you put a bow in a boy's hand and it's like a war club. You know, it's like you're, it's like this. Sure. Sometimes they literally and, try to hit you with it, like a sword. Right. <laughs> and I really had to learn how to just, I think a lot of it, like with the bow, a lot of the bow technique is like a trust issue. You got to trust your partner, which is the cello. So your string holds the bow up. You don't hold the bow up. The string does, which is like my finger now. If I like take away the string, the bow's going to go. So when you play cello, when you gently press down, that's when you feel the stick of the bow pressing back up into your hand. So it's that yin yang thing. But if, if you try to grip it, if you try to hold it too tight, that's you're just, you know, you're, you're losing trust with your instrument. If that makes sense. Mm -hmm. So it, 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 there's a lot to relaxing when you play. I, I don't have technique, Mia. I don't I with that. I, I've never done like yoga. Uh, I don't even eat yogurt. Sorry, that was a bad joke. Um, <laughs> we but, like bad jokes here. <laughs> yeah. The safe space. <laughs> um, but I, I know... I know what it feels like to relax when I play. And I've also gotten to the point, it, it, this is weird. It's like when I'm looking at a piece of music, as opposed to just improvising, I, if I'm, if I, if I have a piece of music right now where there's a the first note is an A and I know I play it with my third finger. So I kind of, that note on the page is not just a note. It's like a feeling. I know what it feels like in my hand and my fingers to play that A with my third finger on the D string. And I, I kind of have a sense of that even before I play the note. If that makes any sense at all. Yeah. No, it does. Over time and experience, you've learned to... Yeah, but it's, it's not one. something that just comes overnight. Yeah, yeah. It's a pro it's a process. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So let's, let's, uh, let's try again with Karen. See, I know, Karen, you're back. Can we hear you now? How's your sound? Unfortunately not, yeah. There is a, there's a microphone symbol on your, on your page somewhere. Oh, is that you there? You want to say hi? I think she's there, but very quiet. 
Could you hear me? Yeah, we can hear you now. Yes. But it's it's kind of cutting in and out, to be honest. Good. So, Fred, hi. Well, Mia, if you can hear her, can you yeah, like interpret? I think I do, when I I think it I might think be in. Anybody. Sorry, Karen. I think it's probably your internet. It's just a little bit. I'm so. No, 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 it's fine. Feel free to like put your question in the chat and then you can ask it. Yeah. Yeah, not a problem. No, no, no. Improv by myself. Can you hear me at all? A little bit. I'm trying to catch what you're saying. Yeah. I'm not sure we're going to catch it. Can you hear me better? There, Does we can hear work? you. Yes, I can hear that. But, like, it's, like, only sometimes. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so, my confusion is... Oh, dear. Is when I play, I can play what I want. And no rules, no nothing, right? But it, just, it doesn't make me know my chords. It doesn't help me play a bass line if I'm in a group of people. A school called Connect Music School. The head of the school, um, Alice, can, um, chord progressions and, and improv using animals. So I... It was animal. Well, it seems so silly to me because so what? I could play, play whatever. Were any um, applicable transfer for self? Okay, I think I know what you're talking about, Karen. Yeah, because I've done that activity. So in Rochester, Fred, there's a school. It's called Alice Connects School of Music. And she does creative ability development. And I, I believe that Karen has taken some of her classes. And in those classes, they do things like, um, they start with simple, so simple sort of improvisation games. Like, uh, let's make the sound of animals on our instrument. Or let's do a question and answer. Um, these things that sort of just get people kind of freeing their minds and playing um, easily. And I think, Karen, you might be saying that you're not quite sure how those skills apply help me trans yeah how they transfer so we'd have to know more about what it is you want to accomplish transfer. Like, and let me interrupt you i can't really hear oh, her I Mia, so you got to interpret what she said yeah yeah i'm trying yeah yeah karen can you see where the chat i'm sorry no 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 it's fine can you see where you can type on the on your screen Yes. You can type a question. It's too much. Yeah, it's a lot. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I know. That's okay. No worries. That's okay. I know we're trying with the sound. It's just like you're cutting in and out. So, yeah. Thank you. Thank you. No problem. I think I think first she was sort of asking how to transfer some of those simple improvisation skills into a more relevant a yeah. relevant performance. How you what? Sort of, if you're like, so she's learned how to do, like, she took some improvisation classes and they do things like making animal sounds on their instrument or question and answer improvisation. And she's wondering how those skills um, apply so. or how to take them to the next level. Um. Yeah, you are actually breaking it up a lot there. I'm, I'm not getting all of that. Okay. I'm sorry. No, 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 it's okay. Can you hear me now, Fred? I can hear you, but it was. It cut out. It was cutting in and out when you're talking. Yes. Sorry, guys. No worries. I'm okay now. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. So I think. I, she like Karen was cutting in and out, but I'm going to ask one more time because I think this is what she was saying. So she's learned some simple improvisation um, games that she has played with her teacher um, at the Rochester School. Um, they do creative. Okay. 
a creative development there. And they do right. things with their students, like um, making animal sounds on their instruments. Okay. Um, or question and answer, like call and response improvisation right. games in right. order to get people to open up. And I believe Karen is wondering how that's relevant, I guess, to, to getting to the next step in improvisation, what that will lead to. Well, anything that she's learning is, is relevant. I mean, that's, that's actually a cool thing to make animal sounds. Um, I was just <laughs> it was like, like, I guess a kitten like that. Right. Right. Yeah. 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 And my dog, when my dog looks straight at me, like three feet away and stares dead at me and goes, woof. So that'd be like, <laughs> maybe a little higher. Like that, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> That's interesting. I never even thought about it. I actually love that question because it actually, like, I think we're coming sort of to the end here, but it gets to the heart of improvisation and why I think sometimes people fear it um, as adults. Uh, because I've noticed that children are much more, tend to be much more open to it, if you get them early enough anyways. I, but, I think, Karen, most of my improvisation has been song-based. It all has to do with a song, whether it's by Duke Ellington or Jimi Hendrix or whoever. And I do most of my improvisations based off the a number of things. I'm basing it off the chord structure of the song. So I know like what notes blend in with the chords. I base it off the, the melodic line, what the singer is singing. So I want to like put a note almost like if let's say I'm singing with a singer, I mean playing with a singer who's a soprano. So I might be adding more of a, a ten, what a tenor singer might sing underneath her. Or maybe uh, I want to do more of a bass line because there's no bass player. So I'm, what I'm doing is dependent on the song and the group that I am playing with. There's, there's no one right note a lot of times, you know, and, and a lot of times I just have to use my instinct and knowledge and ear to, to achieve it. But that's, I've never even thought about animal noises. <laughs> um, yeah, at Alice's school, she works a lot with children. And so that, you know, those games really help them open up. But what I have found, um, because I have noticed like children, children, as is the case in many cases, children, their, their minds are so open that they're often not afraid to try new things, right? And you know, if you're sitting down with your instrument as an adult and you're playing animal sounds or you're just like messing around, a lot of us don't necessarily give ourselves permission to do that as adults because we think, well, I'm, I'm yeah. a serious adult now, so I have to do serious things. But I think a really important part of learning to be a fully rounded improviser is, uh, I don't know if you agree, Fred, but like allowing yourself to be silly. Like children, like allowing yourself to play and not care what comes out and if it doesn't sound, you know, not judging what it sounds like and all that stuff, right? So like Here's really getting into that thing to play. That started happening to me probably about 25, 30 years ago is I started hearing songs in my head. And it, it's like hearing voices, but you don't get locked up for it, you know? Um, and I I didn't even have, nowadays when I hear a melody, what I do is I get on my iPhone and sing it into the, the voice memo thing. But then later I write it down. And then what I do is I figure out what chords go with it. I get my guitar out and, and it's kind of like sometimes here's another thing too like the chords if you have any one given note like let's just say a c there's about there's an innumerable number of chords that would go with that c 
I mean, not just is it C major or C minor, but that C could be the root of the chord. It could be the third of the chord. It could be the fifth of the chord. It could be the seventh of the chord. It could be the ninth of the chord. You see what I'm saying? It could be, it's almost infinite. And so it, it, to me, it was like a real process where I started hearing a melody and then I'd have to figure out what the chords were that I was hearing underneath the melody. Yeah. So that comes into like comp composing. And because I know how to write music, I, I would, I start doing that. I have this program on my computer called Sibelius where I write all my stuff out. Yeah, and, well, I was going like, to um, ask you about um, that just, you know, because we have just a few more minutes and we need to wrap up. But uh, you were mentioning like your arrangements, the arrangements that you make. So if we, if uh, people in the workshop want to get an arrangement of yours, um, should they just write What I want me? them to do is um, I'm going to send, I'll send a list to you, Mia. Okay. And of what you've got. You can send it out and I could do it through you. That might be the easiest way. Yeah, I, I was going to say, yeah. So Fred makes all kinds of cool arrangements. So he'll send me a list of what he's got and then you guys can pick one. I just did one today. That oh, I nice. Finished. Do you want to play it for us before um, we go? It's a nice wrap and up. Me, I'm like, so this is, see if you know this piece. Uh, like that so that's the there's beginning no of ain't no sunshine by bill Withers. that's it there's no sunshine yes and <laughs> so like a lot of my arrangements i start with the melody now i add double stops and triple stops sometimes so i i'm adding the chords like a guitar player would do or a piano player but then what i do is i start improvising but what I, and that's the hard process for me then i write out all my improvisations and they're all written out for people so it's almost becomes like a a lee melodic etude if you will or something nice nice so yeah. but that so, is an improv yeah. what you're doing is you're you're reading an arrangement and and these are are these are pretty advanced most of these yeah I, i'll right. say that i i i, I don't these, cut back these guys I, can do I, it they're all superstars will be fine so <laughs> just bring it to master class guys <laughs> but yeah if what i'll do is i'll send me a like and i also have some teaching materials on how to improvise and they come with accompanying tracks. They're not perfect. It's stuff I did during COVID and I need to work on it more. So if people want some of that, I can send them that. And yeah, I know, I know that a lot of people here enjoy playing it more. Yeah, I know a lot of people enjoy playing to the backing tracks. So if you have some right. of those, that we, that's great. So in this really case, like the backing tracks are me just like strumming guitar. <laughs> awesome. Well, Fred, that's great. I think maybe we have time for one more question. If anyone has something that really that's burning on their mind. Yeah, if it's the last one, make it a good one. <laughs> for God's sake, no pressure. But anybody have a, a last question for Fred? You could just yell it out. <laughs> it seems like you are pretty good at you know, finding finding a note you can hear in your head, is that just something that takes due in your reps? Or was there a specific practice you did to get that going for yourself? Ooh, I'm not as good at that as you think I am. Okay. Um, but yes, a lot of it is just over time. It, the more you do it, the more you improvise, the better you get at it. Right, right, right. Um, mm -hmm. I, I have my younger son, I failed as a parent. He's like a physics major at University of Oregon. And, um, but he's like, with music, he's 
off the charts. He's like Amadeus. He has like um, perfect pitch and a photographic memory. Wow. So he's one of these guys that if you're in a car with him and the radio is playing and there's like five tunes, he can go to your house if you have a piano and play those five tunes that he just, even though he'd never heard them before. It's, it's actually, I've never seen anything like it. I don't have that. I don't have that kind of like perfect pitch and memory. I have, I have pretty good, mm. but it's, it's, it's a skill that the more you do it, the better you get at it. It's all I can say. The more you improvise, the better you get at it. And trust me, my mom, my mom, when I was starting to do this, I'd be practicing down in the basement of their house. And, you know, parents know how to push your buttons, right? She would yell down the stairs, when are you going to start playing any real music? <laughs> so it was like, I didn't know what I was doing. I was like working at it and trying to get out the sounds this, that I was hearing in my head. But it, it really is a process. And you have to let yourself go through that process. And you have to let yourself suck at yeah. times. Yeah. You know, you have to like, you yeah, gotta you really be messy. do. I agree. That's my number one advice as well. Is like, you have to be willing to be bad. Yeah. Cause you're going to be bad at something for a long time before yeah. one day it's like, Oh yeah. Okay, and no, and that's bad. why I really, what was the name of the woman that, that was saying how she just started as an adult. Uh, that's Irene. Yeah. Irene, I, I got to tell you, you moved me more than anyone tonight oh. with that. That is a beautiful thing that you're doing. You're like starting and you're doing it because you want to do it. You're doing it because you love to do it. And just go with that. You don't have to be, you know, Roster Povich overnight. You know, yeah. it's, it's a process. Well, Fred, this has been super great. Thank you so much for uh, Thank you. You are, us. you're like my number one, like favorite cello person. <laughs> Thank you very much. Yeah, I mean, I've been following you online for quite a while and I know how much you give to the uh, online community. So this was really oh my great God, to get I'm your... so glad you guys didn't hear like what was going on the half hour before it started. Oh, times. <laughs> Cause I couldn't figure out what to do. <laughs> it was embarrassing. <laughs> you're not alone <laughs> so if you like worry about how you're sounding with cello you should have seen me trying to figure out how to do this <laughs> it wasn't pretty thank you so much thank you very much and i'll be in touch with you about arrangements and yeah i love you all and um thank you i will send me a like a list of my stuff and i'll just send you guys you know I'll send you stuff, you know, and yeah. they said that as the drug dealers say, the first one is free. Nice. <laughs> <laughs> Bye, Fred. Bye, Bye everybody. You. Bye. Thank you.